cause. This one's a bit shorter. Myeloma isn't as confusing to try and understand, I don't think, as the leukemias because it is just its own thing. Um, it is symptom wise, it tends to be like the more you're reading through and you sort of go, oh, okay. Um, because of the hematological cancers, it's it's pretty unique compared to the other ones, I think. And the myeloproliferative disorders, I never really thought to put much time into them, but they are quite easy to ask questions about. Um, again, because the way they like to do it is sort of just to give you like a very vague patient, a load of blood results, and you've got to pick out what's raised and what's not. Um, anyone who's like sitting there worrying that you need to know, like worrying about knowing your normal values for stuff, don't because as you should have had in third year, you'll get your normal like table of values and you should be able to work out whether something's above or below um so don't worry about learning specific values but learn specifics in things like okay i need to know if there are blasts there that's abnormal for like for instance so case one we've got a 70 year old previously healthy male who presents with nausea vomiting and confusion he's had a six month history of increasing back pain but due to his history history of osteoarthritis he put this down to being nothing significant and he medicated with ibuprofen but he recently noticed that the pain's increasing in his sciatic region. His son, who is accompanying the visit, reports his father's demonstrated an increase in thirst, urination, and low mood. Radio, radio, oh, radiography shows increased um, evidence of osteolytic lesions and an L5 compression fracture of the spine. Neurological examination that you undertake reveals upgoing plantar reflexes with intact muscle power in all groups and normal range of movement. Laboratory data reveals anemia and associated monoclonal proteinemia so this is a couple of cases that i found that i've compiled together so again you probably wouldn't get like as much as this level of knowledge but there's a few things here that are hidden in the diagnosis so you've got an older male who's got this nausea vomiting and confusion um nausea vomiting confusion vaguest couple of things ever so continue and you're thinking right he's got this back pain has he got um some kind of bony infiltration going on increasing pain in the sciatic region um, these weird symptoms of thirst, urination and low mood, which um, sometimes your brain kind of goes, OK, I'm thinking diabetes, but also start to think hypercalcemia when you see words like that. Um, osteolytic lesions, L5 compression fracture. Um, we're still continuing to think hypercalcemia. What could be the cause of this? Upgoing plantar reflexes. Again, that's another thing relating back to the hypercalcemia. Um, but he's also got this concurrent anemia. And the monoclo monoclonal proteinemia just kind of sometimes they'll be nice and they'll give you something like that and you can just go right i i know what this is so this is multiple myeloma um you might also see it described as plasma cell dyscrasia sometimes um because it's coming from if you remember your lineage plasma cells coming from b cells um and they're your antibody producing cells so that shouldn't say I think that should say 55% IgA, 20% IgG. Bear with me a sec, guys. Because if that's not in my notes, I need to correct that for you before I send you off the, send you this presentation. Yeah, so it's 55% IgG, 20% IgA. I'll change that and I'll make sure that these sides are fine. Um, sorry about that. So yeah, it's about 1% of all malignant disease. So not common at all, but um, they love it in exam questions because it's, there's just like so many weird and wonderful symptoms going on with it. Um, so tends to happen more commonly in males, but you get this characteristic Bentz Jones protein in urine, which is typically from your, is that over there? So I can still see you guys chatting to me. It's from this like paraproteinemia that you're getting um, just depositing in, in the urine or coming out in the urine. And it deposits in other places as well. So like in the, in the kidneys, which we'll talk about in a second. So it can be asymptomatic. Um, so you may get an exam question that is just like totally normal patient, feeling a bit off, but they've got benzodiazepine protein in the urine, something like that. Um, but the typical way they like to describe it is with causing this bony destruction. It goes for your vertebral column and your long bones leading to this bony pain, spinal cord compression, hypercalcemia. So hypercalcemia, um, the way to remember it is stones, bones, moans and groans. So thirst, urination, weakness, fatigue, abdominal pain, confusion, 
um, cardiac abnormalities leading to arrhythmias, depression, anxiety, pancreatitis, loads of things going on. Um, I find the stones, bones, bones and groans thing sometimes then makes it harder for me to break down actually what's going on, um, but it works for some people. You also get these things called soft tissue plasmocytomas. So these are just like other deposits of um, plasma cell tumors, which can actually like, they can happen in isolation as well. Like they don't have to be um, as part of multiple myeloma, but usually that's actually the cause of the spinal cord compression. Um, if you get bone marrow infiltration, you're going to get bony pain, anemia, thrombocytopenia, um, and neutropenia. Um, you get this blood hyperviscosity, which can cause you like increased susceptibility towards both types of thrombosis. Um, because again, you're getting these deposits of these light chains in the renal tubules, increases your susceptibility to AKI. And in about 20 to 30% of cases, you can get renal failure as well. Okay, so I included it here as well. So it's important to know because I used to, at least me, like have this habit of like seeing the whole thirst et cetera, et cetera, thing in an exam question and going, okay, diabetes insipidus, diabetes, what's going on? Like, look for the other like characteristic symptoms that are going on as well. So constipation being one. Um, so yeah, nausea and vomiting. Um, yeah, you can read them there if you want to. So investigations. Um, so on your full blood count, you're looking for Generally, most of it will be normal unless there's been bone marrow infiltration, in which case they'll normally be quite low. Um, your ESR is high because this is like a, quite a chronic state of inflammation you've got going on. And you can get this thing called rouleau formation. Um, it's, again, like not an important like, phenomenon to understand. It basically just means that the red blood cells are sacking. Um, you get it in like an aggressive version of this, but you might get a question where it sort of talks about rouleau formation. Um, there's other things that you get it in, like some of the anemias, but in a cancer sense, we tend to associate it with this. Um, you'll do UNEs because you might see evidence of an AKI. Serum calcium, obviously, is going to be, well, it's probably going to be raised, but ALP will be normal. So if you're holding some of the, um, your orthopedic conditions um, as differentials, like, ALP being normal is like one of the key things to differentiate this from those. Um, total protein will be raised, serum protein, electrophoresis. You can look for those monoclonal bands. Um, skeletal survey. So you might see something referred to in like particularly past med questions as pepper pot skull. And that's a picture. There's a picture of this just here. So it's just like a skull that's full of lytic lesions. I don't know why particularly it is the skull, but that tends to be what they like referring to. Um, look for spinal cord compression as well on um on mri is the best way the best modality for like looking at this and ldh as with all your hematological cancers if that's raised you've got increased cell turnover it's a poor prognostic marker so what tends to happen you're going to use just a lot of different chemo agents to try and uh, to try and tackle it but this is it's, it's a sad disease because unfortunately like we can prolong survival but it's incurable at the end so you're just going to kind of help correct any anemia help correct hypercalcemia usually with like um, IV fluids, bisphosphonates and mitigate the risk of spinal cord compression um, with high dose dexamethasone. And then if you've got any lytic lesions, pin them if you can, if your patient's well enough to. So anyone who's done um, palliative one should know stuff about spinal cord compression, but it's um, sadly like just one of those like very nasty terminal events that can happen. So moving on to your myeloproliferative disorders. So these are due to clonal proliferation of myeloid stem cells. Um, I used to get this really confused with your myelodysplastic diseases. Um, so in myeloproliferative, you're just getting more of the normal cells. Myelodysplastic, they're just going a bit wrong, a bit weird all over the place. Um, but they can both kind of show features of each other. So it's a bit confusing. So the table on the, the right there is just to kind of give you a bit of an indication of some of the differences. So like there's an increased risk of them both going to AML, which is kind of confusing. But with your myelodysplastic ones, which we just covered before, we don't break those down into the four different types that we're going to go over today. Um, we already have known from one of them because one of them is CML. Um, so yeah, if it's excess proliferation of red blood cells, you're looking at polycythemia vera. Excess proliferation of white cells, it's CML. 
platelets, it's essential thrombocytopenia. And if it's a fibroblast, it's myelofibrosis. Um, so yeah, they're all going to be Philadelphia chromosome negative as well. So that's another thing that they might throw into a question just to say um, that we don't have that. So generalized polycythemia is just a state of having increased red blood cells. Um, so you can get something called relative polycythemia when you've got red blood cells that are normal size, but um, the plasma volume is reduced. So this just generally happens like if I was really dehydrated now, that could happen. Um, it could also happen on a more chronic level if I was um, hypertensive, obese, I was drinking a lot or smoking a lot. And then you get absolute polycythemia. Um, if, if it's primary, it's polycythemia vera. If it's secondary, you can get it in high altitude, but that adaptation tends to take about two weeks or so. Uh, chronic lung disease, cyanotic congenital heart disease, um, or anything where it's causing increased erythropoietin secretion, so renal and hepatic cancers, and increased smoking. So it occurs as an adaptation to a change in physiological state or environment. So case two, got a 65 year old lady who goes for her routine blood checks. Over the past few years, despite maintaining good health, her hemoglobin levels have been gradually increasing. She reports recent episodes of facial flushing, itchiness after her usual evening baths, especially around her toes and fingertips. On examination, her face appears erythematous and her spleen is mildly enlarged, but non-tender. So key features in this, we've got an older lady um, she's got this gradual increase of hemoglobin as opposed to like the decrease that we've seen in some of the other um, leukemias, for instance. Um, this really weird facial flushing, itchiness, um, and a bit of splenomegaly, but nothing like quite as drastic as we saw with um, CML, for instance. So this is a typical picture, what well, a typical symptomatic picture of polycythemia vera. So as we said before, it is the primary polycythemia. Um, tends to occur in people that are over 60, not, there's no gender preference for it. Um, they get excess red cells. You can also get excess white cells and platelets, but it's on an exam question at least, it's normally pretty clear cut. It's associated with something called a JAK2 mutation, but it will be Philadelphia chromosome negative. And features, the two like key ones that are quite unique to it, or at least like unique to your um, this set of, of conditions is this itchiness after a hot bath and something that you call erythromyalgia, which is where you get this burning in your fingers and toes and what you call dusty congestion of the extremities. So they just start to look a bit dusky, like dark, I guess. Um, and then because you've got this hyperviscosity from having excess cells, um, again, like the circulation to say like your brain, ears, eyes, isn't as it should be. So you're going to get increased headaches, tinnitus, visual disturbances. Um, and these things called facial plethora, they just look quite flushed in the face. Um, and an increased risk of venous and arterial thrombosis because of that hyperviscosity as well. Investigation, so yeah, you're going to have a raised red cell count. Um, you're going to need cytogenetics to differentiate it from CML because, again, these are all like key differentials of one another. Um, erythropoietin will be reduced because you've got that negative feedback loop, um, unless, of course, this is that the underlying cause is like an erythropoietin secretion. Um, well, no, because it would be primary then, but yeah, you want to do it as well to rule out whether um, it could be a renal tumor or something that's causing your polycythemia. Um, and you can do something called chromium studies um, to look at red cell mass. Um, so again, not something that you characteristically do most of the time, but something that you might want to consider doing in this case. Um, and if you've got that as positive and splenomegaly, um, then that's pretty diagnostic for this. Um, so how are you going to manage it? You want to try and keep your muscular level, level below 0.45 because you've got quite a big thrombosis risk with this kind of thing. Um, so you're going to do venesection in younger patients and give a drug called hydroxycarbamide um, in an older patient. And as well, because of that thrombosis risk, um, give them 75 milligrams aspirin once daily as, um, as like your got the word for it, to reduce the risk of, of clotting, um, your clotting prophylaxis. And you want to monitor the full blood count about every three months. Um, so there is a risk of it transitioning over to myelofibrosis, which is like the last one we're going to talk about today, or there's a small risk of it becoming an acute leukemia. Um, but more often patients tend to, if they're going to get, get affected by it, um, it's usually thrombosis or hemorrhage that's the risk with this. So case three, got a 64-year-old woman who presents with burning pain in her hands and feet, as well as dizziness and occasional headaches. 
She's got a history of repeated TIAs, but no evidence of significant stenosis upon carotid ultrasound. Platelet count is extremely elevated. So key things here, again, she's pretty old. She's got this erythromyalgia going on and these symptoms from um, hyperviscosity that we picked up on and just talked about. She's got repeated TIAs, but we're not thinking um, it's like a classical carotid artery um, cause and platelet count is extremely elevated. So this is a, thre a central thrombocytosis. So platelets being excessively raised from excess proliferation of megakaryocytes. Um, most patients tend to be asymptomatic and this is a bit of a weird one because there's no features of this that kind of go, yes, that is a central thrombocytosis. But normally in an exam question, they're just going to have this isolated um, increased tendency towards um, bleeding or thrombosis just because the function is pretty abnormal. Um, and then you, again, you get those, that microvascular occlusion from hyperviscosity, leading to like headaches, um, visual changes, chest pain, aversive neuralgia, which we talked about already. Um, management again, aspirin, hydroxycarbamide. You might give, if you like specific treatments for it, interferon alpha 2b and basalfan, but again, like not really drugs that are worth kind of going away and reading up on, um, unless you really want to. Um, but I've not really seen them come up in like common sets of stuff. Um, life expectancy is pretty normal, but you will still follow it up about every three months with a full blood count. Um, and you can with these particularly get um if you're a pregnant um pregnant woman you can get this placental infiltration so you've got an increased risk of intrauterine uh, growth restriction spontaneous abortions and things like that um so you will like these pregnant women if they have this they're in like your high risk category for who to monitor a bit more case four so final one sorry it's been a long one guys um you've got a 72 year old woman who presents quite flustered because she's recently been having to change her nightgown twice in the night and has noticed that in the last six months her nightgowns are now far too big for her. She's recently been much more tired, bruising easily and on an examination she's found to have an enlarged spleen um, and it's, this is verified in MRI. Bone marrow biopsy reveals increased megakaryocytes with a moderate increase of reticulin fibres. Philadelphia chromosome comes back negative. So again, older woman, uh, older patient even, um, she's been sweating through her nightgown so we're thinking is that one of the b symptoms where she's like you know losing weight sweating getting a fever um she is tired bruising easily so we're thinking okay is this potentially like a pancytopenia picture and large spleen um increased megakaryocytes the, the thing about reticulin fibers is a bit of a red herring um because that is part of the definition of what we're about to talk about but Again, like I wouldn't worry about the significance of it too much unless you really want to know your structures of different cells. Um, and Philadelphia chromosome negative is just my way of sort of hinting to you that it's not CML um, and it's myelofibrosis. So this is, aside from CML, sort of the one that you don't really want to have out of, um, out of these disorders. So it's a chronic progressive myeloproliferative disorder um, and it, it just it can happen with a lot of different bone marrow disorders so um, it, it can ha basically can happen secondarily to a lot of them um, you tend to get hyperplasia of the megakaryocytes um, and because you've got all these growth factors going on you get this quite intense fibrosis of your liver and your spleen the paraspinomegaly is pretty massive um, and you more commonly tend to see those b symptoms your night sweats fever and weight loss abdominal discomfort due to spinomegaly uh, bone marrow failure and in a blood film you get these characteristic tear blood red teardrop red blood cells um full blood count you'll have reduced reduced hemoglobin um and you're going to have to take a bone marrow trephin for diagnosis so this when you're looking at bone marrow samples you might see bone marrow aspiration and bone marrow trephin they're just two different ways of taking it that have different uses um but generally like you might just see questions referring to it as saying like bone marrow sample um so you're just going to give like a low risk patient who's not got any symptoms just manage them like watch what wait wait watchfully for them but if they're starting to get those symptoms it's looking bad you're worried about them progressing onto something else due to bone marrow failure then consider that stem cell transplant if they're young um and the median survival of this is only about four to five years so again not another great one and that's it um 